My studio guest now is Harry Schutt, author of a book called The Trouble with Capitalism, which is an inquiry into the causes of global economic failure. I haven't yet read it, but I do have my own theory that capitalism existed in the first place. Harry, welcome. You used to work for the Economist Intelligence Unit, so I, I guess I can't put you down as a Marxist-Leninist, can I? Uh, no, partly Marxist, but not Leninist at all. Well, that's probably where I am uh, too, uh, so perhaps we'll get on famously. What is the trouble with capitalism? Well, the trouble with capitalism in, at one level is just exactly what it was in Karl Marx's day, which is a propensity to overproduce and, and accumulate capital. I mean, the capitalism suffers from this huge dead weight of, of accumulated capital. And nowhere productive to invest it, nothing productive that's to right. invest it in. That's right. Increasingly that is the problem and it's more particularly a problem now which is something which was not apparent in Marx's day because we have high technology uh, destroying jobs everywhere and uh, not, sorry, not, not just destroying jobs but destroying the need for capital because the high-tech investments that are needed don't require nearly as much capital as, for example, the railways did in the Victorian era. And that's why we have uh, capital, the free market. And yet, in any sane economy, overproduction would not be a problem because it would mean an abundance of things that people needed and wanted. Is it that the overproduction is concentrated in just some areas and in just some things. There's no overproduction of food in the world, for example. Mm. Although there are many fat people in Britain and the United States, there are still many hungry people elsewhere in the world. There's no overproduction of medicine, except in some parts of the world, and for rich people. Viagra, yes. Exactly. Yes, there's overproduction of Viagra and underproduction of malarial uh, exactly. Uh, remedies. Exactly. No, you're quite right. I mean, it is, it, it's, and of course that is because the profit motive dictates that capital will, will follow where the, where the most money is to be made. And that isn't providing for the needs of poor people, surprisingly. Now, your book, The Trouble with Capitalism, is, uh, is, is an impressive one. So it must be more than one line long. So it can't just be overproduction. Lay out your thesis for the, for the viewers, will you? Well, um, the... Um, uh, the over overproduction is, is the, uh, has been the main cause and the attempt to overcome this by means of speculation has been, has been the factor which we've been facing. I mean, if you, I can take you back a bit. Do. The, um, the uh, Keynesian model, which was supposed to, uh, according, according to which deficiencies in demand and imbalances in the capitalist system could be overcome by judicious use of, of a government subsidy, uh, expansion of, of uh, uh, money supply, or uh, use of fiscal policy. That model really collapsed in the 1970s. It was shown that it couldn't, as people had assumed, end the business cycle. And the business cycle is the essence of what's wrong with capitalism, as again Karl Marx identified back in the 19th century. And once that had happened, in the 70s, once we found that in fact Keynes couldn't solve the problem, there was this decision to revert to... Um, to uh, monetarism. Mon well, monetarism or what's become neoliberalism, because monetarism is a bit of a, a, bit of a sham, really. I, I, I don't particularly want to go into that. But essentially, the, what we were told is that there's been too much state intervention in the economy, and we must cut back public spending and, and the role of the state generally, unleash the forces of enterprise. I don't know if you remember that phrase. I do, yes. And, and um, that, that, that this would stimulate, stimulate investment and production. And the most extreme expression of this was the so-called supply-side economics theory in, in uh, practice by the Reagan administration, where they cut taxes in a huge way. And, and in the idea on the basis this was going to stimulate investment. Well, it, it didn't. It, sp it stimulated speculation. Well, it turned out to be voodoo economics, as That's the correct, first yeah. George Bush described it. Yeah, absolutely right. Before he became vice president. Yes, um, uh, it, indeed. And uh, that, anyway, that, that blew up in inflationary speculation. We, we had, then we had the 1987 crash, which hardly anyone remembers now. It didn't last very long. But at that point, and this is what I think is crucial, in, in understanding the present situation, and we, we won't hear this reflected much elsewhere in the media, 
is that they decided that the only way to keep the show on the road was through market manipulation. Uh, there was a body formed in the States called the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, which has been dubbed by the Washington Post as the Plunge Protection Team. Uh, they, it's, 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 a, it's a committee made up of the top people in the, in the Federal Reserve and, and the U.S. Treasury, and they come together to, to decide whenever the market seriously turned down, how they're going to manipulate it, how they're going to encourage um, investors to come back into the market by uh, giving uh, subsidies or, or selling cheap government bonds um, and various other mechanisms. Uh, and, and also allowing, allowing um, actual manipulation of markets, whether stock markets or, or the commodity markets, gold mar the gold market, for example, is a very good instance of it. All, all of this is, of course, completely secret. This is never publicized. Because of, it, of course, if it was, people would realize that the markets are not just a casino, but they are a sham casino. Yeah, they're a casino that's being fraudulently well, manipulated. The croupier has, it's a, a yes. casino where the croupier has his foot on the wheel the whole time. Yes. Or, or yes. takes it on and off. Yes. As, as it's not even as honest as a casino. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you and I are getting on famously, and uh, we agree that capitalism is essentially a sham. Mm. Even though, of course, in its early period, it, as Marx predicted, unleashed enormous uh, yes. productive potential, changed the world, and, uh, and on the whole, uh, took us, took the human race forward with many casualties, but yes. forward. Right. But now it has to resort to fakery and, uh, and uh, Elmar Gantries uh, to keep it on the road. What we're less clear about is what kind of an alternative there might be. How else could we run a modern economy, if not by this, uh, by this uh, jiggery-pokery? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is to, well, you, you, you've got to start from first principles and say um, that cap capitalism or capital is no longer a benefit. Because we, as I, I was trying to explain, I think, just now, we don't need it uh, in, in anything like the, the quantities we, we did in the past and therefore it is surplus to requirements and that means also that you're going to have more and more problems generating a, a return on on the what you what you've got on what's there in your balance sheet and I, I mean I have done estimates of this which suggest that you could probably take out or, or rather the 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 cost of the um, uh, servicing this capital, in other words, generating profits to, uh, to service the existing capital, which is absolutely useless, is possibly 15 or 20 percent of GDP. Now, we could, could do an awful lot with that, but we have to start from the, 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 the basis that you don't need all this capital, you don't, you don't, all these profits, because you don't need to service the dead capital. And, and, uh, it needs, it needs to be worked out in a detailed model, but what it would translate to in practice is not the uh, traditional model, if you like, of, of state ownership, although there would be a degree of that. The state has to intervene um, in, in certain sectors and, and will have to regulate, because one thing we can't have, and this is a particular obsession of mine, one thing we cannot have, um, I mentioned I think that the labor is also sur surplus to requirements. We cannot go on with this ridiculous race to the bottom, which is affecting jo not just nations but globally. We're chasing down wages on the basis that there is enough, uh, enough work out there to f to, for everyone to be fully employed at a decent standard of living. Now again, the Victorians knew that wasn't true. If you go back to the classical economists, Malthus knew it wasn't true. Keynes knew it wasn't true, but still that's the model we're following. Now, I, my, one, one of the basic principles, therefore, that I'm, I'm seeking to get considered is that everyone will be entitled in, in a civilized, in civilized economy to come. Everyone will be entitled to a basic income, which will not be huge, and it may, may even require them to do, if you like, a day's or a week's a public service of some kind every year, but they'd be entitled to that basic, basic income as a basic right of citizenship. Um, and, and that uh, that would take away the need to create useless jobs for people. 